1 Samuel. And last week in that series, I taught on the area of our faith believes, then faith moves, and then faith moves God. However, at the end of that message, in the faith moves God, a number of people kind of got confused and thought that in what I was sharing about our faith moving God, that suddenly I had become some kind of a word of faith kind of a preacher. So I am here this morning to clarify that, okay? And to make certain that you know that that is not what I believe. How I would uh, see this thing is to explain it to you, to bring clarification. And this isn't part of the sermon. If I finish in time, I'll go to the sermon in 1 Samuel that I had prepared. But this came up this week, and some people were wondering, what do I really mean? What I really mean is what I believe is in Scripture. So I'll start, first of all, with the word of faith idea is the idea of what we call in a, in a very kind of a rude kind of a way is name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, uh, you know, that kind of a deal. And there is a, a part of that where it brings out essentially a New Age doctrine. And the New Age doctrine is this, that if we speak it enough, if we say it enough, we will bring it into creation or into existence. We are not able to create those things. My, my uh, uh, proof of that would be if you were to go out here and stand out into the, the field and say, create a tree. I don't think you can do that. We can plant a tree, we can plant the seed from a tree, but we cannot make a tree. And so what I want to clarify this morning for our church as a whole, because we don't want that doctrine moving through here because it brings tremendous confusion to us. And that is that we are a people who walk with Christ as a humble camp of children. That our goal when we pray is not to tell God what to do, but we're asking God. So last week when I was saying that our faith moves God, our prayer moves God, it was to indicate to you the idea that when we pray, God is listening. And when we pray, God hears and then God responds to our prayers. If he didn't, he would not be much of a God. He'd be the same kind of God of all the other false gods that we see. But the God that we worship is a living God. He is a listening God. He is a giving God. He is a powerful God. And when we pray, we do actually impact God and cause him, if we choose by faith, to cause him to move on our behalf and in favor of us. So the intent that was intended last week was that God responds to faith. So in an in, in, uh, in example, let's say you've got a, a sick elbow, you know, you've got a, a pain in your elbow. I'm not going to pray that, that to the elbow. I'm going to pray to God. But I actually hear people who speak to the elbow. And elbow, listen to me. You know, that kind of thing. And I don't mean it to sound facetious or, or rude, but, but that's not right. I don't pray to any body part. I pray to the living God who created the body part. And so when I pray for people for healing or any area of their lives, I don't just pray to God and say, well, Lord, here's my faith. I also have another phrase that you might have heard if you've ever had me pray for you, and that is, Lord, I bring to you this person in the name of Jesus Christ. We come with our faith, and we're asking for this because you've told us we can ask. But we also want to acknowledge the fact that it is not just our faith, but it is your faith faithfulness that accomplishes the task. We don't do it. We might have gifts of healing, which means that when we pray, God hears in a special way for whatever reason or dispensation, and he uses a particular person in the gift and ministry of healing. My older sister is one of those persons. When she prays for healing, she has a tremendous record or success record or ratio of people being healed. So not every time, but a high ratio, much higher than my own. But the reality is we're praying to the living God. Let me show you this from Scripture in a number of ways, and if I get to the usual sermon, we will, and if not, we won't. But this is an addendum to last week's message. In James chapter 4, verse 2, James is writing about the idea of asking God for things in prayer. He says, you have not because you ask not. You have not, let's say it together, you have not because you ask not. 
We don't make demands of God. James didn't write, you have not because you don't demand. Okay? That's not our position. We are the children of God. We are the servants of God. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. And we don't tell him anything to do. We've seen Peter try that once or so in the New Testament. It never turned out well. Amen? He never got, it, <clears throat> never got it right whenever he tried to tell Jesus what he should be doing. We also find in John 14, verse 13 through 14, and I think Carol will put it up here. You can read this. Let's see. If, I think it's going to come up. John 14, verse 13 through 14. It goes like this. Up to this point, you have not asked anything in my name, but now you may ask in my name, and when you ask in my name, is a paraphrase, my Father will do it. It will happen if you ask it in my name. Now, some people in the Word of Faith movement take that as a carte blanche, that I can throw out my credit card of prayer and faith and it will happen. That's not what's going on here. What Jesus is saying that now that we pray in his name, we're essentially coming to the Father in a very unique way through the Son, Jesus Christ. And by praying in his name, we are praying according to his will. Let me show you that. In 1 John chapter 5, you can take your Bibles and turn there if you'd like. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. And many, many people miss this and don't understand what's going on. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask, say if we ask. With, with conviction. If, there we go. If we ask anything, now listen to this according to his will. Say it with me. According to his will. One more time. According to his will. So if we ask anything, we have a great confidence that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know, and that's the faith part, if we know, if we really believe he's listening, and we should, if we know <clears throat> that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we asked of him. The qualifier is whether or not it is in his will. That's what we have to know when we come to God in prayer. So when you hear me say that our faith moves God, I think now you understand what I'm trying to convey. That when we're in a conflict and we pray for God's help, we should expect him to help us, amen? If you're in a battle somewhere, in a battlefield overseas, and you pray, God, help me, don't you expect him to help you? That changes what he's doing. It may be, obviously, that he knew eons ago before we were ever created that you would be in that foxhole, you'd be hiding behind that wall, getting bullets flying over your head. He knew that, but when it happened, he was waiting for you to pray that he would be released, as it were, to move on your behalf. You got the concept? So this is not the word of faith. This is not whatever I say God's going to do. But it's what I say and pray in faith in accordance with his will that we have confidence God will accomplish. Amen? Now, come on. You're more sleepy than the first group. Amen? All right. I'm going to have to make you guys stand up and do some calisthenics so you don't wake up here. Okay? So I'm passing out more coffee. But the reality is we don't tell God anything. We ask him to do it. I remember the very first time, it was my sister Dottie many years ago. We were in a group Bible study. We used to do ministry together many years ago in the Northwest. And somebody was kind of coming out with this whole thing about the word of faith. And, and everybody's trying to answer it in a really kind and patient way. And Dottie just pops out and she says, God said we can ask, we can't tell him. That settled it. That's the way it is. So we asked. Now let me give you some examples, all from the book of Mark, of times when people came and got things from God because they intersected with him and they spoke to him and he listened. Now remember, Jesus is the Son of God, or as we might say, God in the flesh, God incarnate. So when Jesus is walking throughout Palestine, throughout that region in his earthly life, that was God walking among men, Emmanuel, God with us, amen? We have that same Jesus today. So let's we'll start at Mark chapter 1, verse 40. I'll go through about six or seven of these very rapidly, then I'll try to get to the first Samuel lessons. But the first thing we see in Mark chapter 1, verse 40, the first miracle where someone is asking is a, is a blind, as a leper. The leper comes to Jesus and he begs him. 
That means he's begging, and we'll see if it's up here. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, now look at this, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So he's not demanding anything, he's begging. Imploring means he's begging. He's on his hands and knees, maybe laying on his face in the dirt before the Lord and say, God, if you're willing, you can get me out of this mess. You see, leprosy was a bad disease in itself, but in Israel, it was considered a mark and a punishment for grievous sin. So here this man is begging God, imploring God, if he is willing to do something for him. And Jesus does what? He says, I will be clean. So Jesus was moving on, doing whatever he was doing, and suddenly the man speaks and asks for help, and God stops, and he helps him. Let's go to Mark chapter 5, verse 23. This is the story of Jairus. He's a ruler in Israel. He comes, and he's begging Jesus. He says, listen, my daughter is lying at the very door of death. If you would come, you can save her. And it says in that same passage, he begged him earnestly. Earnestly means with tremendous intensity. The man was probably in tears, begging God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, to do something about his situation. Now, Jesus was on his way to another program at the moment, but he's interrupted by Jairus, and guess what? The girl is healed, isn't she? She survives. She is brought to life, and she rests in Christ today, I'm sure. Mark chapter 7, verse 26. There's a woman who kept asking for her daughter to be delivered from a demon. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician. That means she's not even part of Israel. She's just a Gentile. To the Jews, she's just a dog. She's not worth anything, but she comes to Jesus, the Son of God, the rabbi, the Jewish Son of God, and she kept asking. That means you could say she kept asking and asking and asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. She didn't tell him to do it. She asked him. Very important. And Jesus does so. He says, go your way. She's, she's set free. That's what's going on in that particular passage in Mark 7. Mark 7, 32. Others are bringing a deaf mute man. The man can't ask for himself. And, and he can't hear and he can't speak. Probably can't speak because he couldn't hear for a long time. Others are begging Jesus on his behalf. Saying, Lord, would you heal this man? And what happens? Jesus what? Thank you. Someone out there is awake. Okay, Jesus heals that individual. And then Mark chapter 8, 22, a man that is blind. Others come for him. They're begging for him that he would be healed. They're interrupting the plan, the known plan, the, obviously, uh, the obvious plan it appears to be for Jesus on his, his uh, move to wherever he's going. Jesus stops and he heals that man. And then we see in Mark chapter 9, one of my favorites, where the man comes, his son has got a demonic problem and the disciples can't get it out. And so he says, look, I came to your disciples. They can't do anything. So I guess I'm going to come to the big, the, big, the big guy. And I'm asking if you can. Jesus says, if I can, only believe. And the man says, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. Here's a man who's desperate for his son to be delivered from a demon that throws him in the fire and dunks him in the water and does all these horrible things to him and gives him these, uh, these seizures. And Jesus stops right there and takes care of this young man. And then the last one in Mark chapter 10 is the story of blind Bartimaeus, one of my favorite of all the stories. Here's Jesus walking along the road. He's got an entourage and he's got a crowd following him. And all of a sudden, I don't know how blind Bartimaeus knew. Somebody might have said, hey, that, that rabbi's coming by. There goes that Jesus. And here he calls out. He says, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. He's asking. He's begging for the mercy of God. And I can just see it. Jesus is going along, and he hears that voice of faith. And he stops. And everybody's telling that man, shh, stop. Do you know the story? And so Jesus stops, and he spots him. And the guy's still yelling, he won't, and Jesus says, tell him to come, bring him over here. And the man throws off his garment, the outer garment, so he don't want to trip on it, I suppose. Maybe he's throwing off the garment of a beggar, because he'd been a beggar all of his life. And now he's coming to Jesus, and he's healed. So do you get the message? All of these people came to Jesus. No one made a demand of Jesus, but they asked for his help at their point of need. Very important distinction between a good, sound, biblical church and a church who's wheeling off onto this word of faith doctrine. 
we want to stay church solid. Amen? We want to stay solid in the scripture so that when we go to the Father, we are not being presumptuous. We're not praying in a way that we are trying to demand anything of the Lord, but we are trying in our best way to come to God with the conditions, with the situations, and with faith saying, Lord God, enter into this mess and make it right for us, please. How many of you have ever witnessed a healing? Anybody? Yeah, I've seen a lot of healings. A number have come through my hand. But you know, typically when, when people are asking me to pray for them for healing, typically I will not pray for them by myself. I'll go grab two or three more people. You want to know why? Because one, sometimes my faith isn't strong enough. And number two, and more importantly, if several of us are praying for an individual that needs healing, and they're healed knowing and say, oh, it was Susan, or oh, it was Pastor John, oh, it was Shirley. They can only say, it was God. Because they can't identify whose prayer at that moment was God responding to. That's the way it should be. That's why I believe James says, if anyone's sick, call the elders, let them anoint you with oil, and the sick man will be made well. You don't want to take the glory of God. We want to give the glory to God. We don't want to declare it was this person or that person. And we confess that there are people who have been given strong gifts of healing. There are not many that run around that we know of, but those who do have that have an amazing power. But there's a tremendous temptation with those kinds of individuals to take the glory of God, to begin to think how wonderful they are. We don't have anything that God hasn't given us. Amen? So I just want you to understand, I know I'm not going to get to the other message, but I want you to understand that we're not to be a people who should demand anything from our God. He makes the demands, amen? His demands are called commands, and that means that we are supposed to follow the thing that God has asked us to do. So when you go to a point where you're praying to the Father, first of all, faith believes, Second of all, faith moves. Prayer is moving. It may not be a physical action, but it is a verbal action. It is a mental and spiritual action. Faith then moves. And then when faith moves, it speaks to the Father. And then God moves on our behalf. Our faith moves God. That's just the way it is. But it's not a demand. God is not a genie in a bottle that we release through prayer. God is not a cosmic errand boy or a cosmic Santa Claus, but he is God. And when we speak to him, I don't understand this, but he likes to hear us. He listens to us. Did you know that? Turn to somebody and say, hey, God listens to us. He really does. When we pray to him about our situation or our children or our family or someone in our church, God is listening to what we're saying. That tells me that when we say it, let's be certain that it's biblical. Let's be certain that it comes with all the reverence and respect that is due to the living God. It tells me that when we pray, there is a communication going. It's not just us talking to God, but we need to be listening to the Father to say, what is your will if I am to pray in this situation? Father, show me your will. Because when I hit that, I can be guaranteed, I can be confident, according to 1 John, that you are going to answer, that things are going to happen. Remember old uh, Noah Hutchins with the Southwest Radio Bible Church. You guys remember Noah Hutchins? He's passed on be with the Lord. But he used to open his, his show or close it, I can't remember which. He says, God, and he had that funny voice, God is still on the throne, and prayer changes things, you know? I don't know if he had dentures or what, but he spoke truth. He, he said it just like it was. God is on the throne and prayer changes things. Why does it change things? Because it brings God into the context. Sometimes God moves into the context of our lives without us even asking. I think he does that a lot. But there are certain times in certain situations where God is waiting for us to call upon his name. I don't know why. I guess it's because once we pray and he moves, it increases and strengthens our faith. That's the only thing I can figure out. 
But that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be a people who reverence him. And not only in the reverencing and understanding who he is, but accepting the fact that he really is inclined toward you and me. You ever do that? You ever think about that? God really loves you. Amen? He really loves you. And that's hard for us sometimes to comprehend. You see, God, God doesn't just love you. He likes you, you know? And, and that's different too, isn't it? And, and when we have this experience, this relationship with God going on in this conversation we call prayer. And you see, prayer is not just us going up, but it's God coming down. And yet God is not just up there. God is in here. And when we speak to God the Father, his spirit is speaking inside of us. His spirit in us is getting excited. Did you know that? When we speak to God in prayer in real faith, expecting God to move in our lives and do those certain things that we've asked for, he's excited about that. I believe that. I think God waits to do things for us when we ask. So it's kind of like, well, it's kind of like when you give your child a present on their birthday or a child on Christmas, or you just show up one day with a present. And the kid's sitting there, what is this? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a gift for you. And it's something they really, really want, you know. And they open it up, and you see the joy in their faces. That makes you feel good, doesn't it? I think God is the same way. He wants us to bring to him our lives. He wants us to bring to him those things that are important to him. Not demanding, but coming sometimes broken, sometimes afraid, sometimes confused, Anybody here besides your pastor ever been confused while you're praying? Man, I, I get that a lot. I'm, I start out and I'm going one direction. The Lord says, no, you need to go this direction. And I go, okay, I'm going that direction. And I'm thinking, how did I get way over here when I should have been way over there? But that's the way God is. So that's what I'm trying to convey to you today. I'll let you out early, actually, because I haven't got a lot more to tell you. But that this, that we are not a word of faith kind of folks. We are a people who come to a God who loves us, a God who listens to us, a God who longs to teach us, who longs to help us, who longs to be involved in all aspects of our lives. And you cannot demand any of it from God, but you can ask. You can ask God to show you what it means to dwell in a rich fellowship with him. You can ask God to heal parts of your body or parts of your mind or parts of your emotions. You can ask God to help you with the relationships in your lives, some good, some bad, some in the middle. God is open to every part of your life. Did you know that? That's what he's interested in. But you make no demands on God. Come to him in humility. Come to him confessing his greatness. That song we sang this morning, that the earth is filled with his glory. That's how we should come to the Father. We should be able to say to him, Father, I see that you are the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-loving, the all-giving God. And I have proof of that because you gave your son, because you gave for me your precious son, Jesus to die for me on a cross, to be able to provide for me the gift of the Holy Spirit, to be able to provide for me the power of healing, the power of recovery, the power of restoration. All of that comes from God. Amen? That's what I want you to see today. I had a whole other sermon prepared, but there we are. But I want you to grasp this, that we are a people who come in faith, not presumption, not demanding, but in humility and saying to God, I need your help. And he loves that prayer. That's what was missing in King Saul. We'll talk about King Saul next week. But that's what was missing. He didn't get the message. He didn't understand how God wanted to serve him, how God wanted to bless his life by a promise, not a demand.
Amen? Father, I don't know how I'm going to fix this all next week because we're going to have two different sermons somehow. But anyway, I'll leave that in your court. But I ask you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to touch our congregation, both the first and the second service. Teach us and remind us how much you love us. Keep us within your perfect care, O Lord. Guide us by your Spirit. Help us to have the confidence to come to you and to bring to you all of our needs, to bring to you everything that is on our hearts, Lord, those things which hurt us, those things which frighten us, those things which concern us. Let Jesus Christ be our guiding principle. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you know how to pray now?